and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And so he, everybody's probably like, uh, uh, probably like you right now, right? What? what? Oh, okay, I, I kind of get that, but what do you mean? So he said, let me tell you what I mean. Let me tell you what I mean. Verse 16. Uh, let me tell you a parable. So Jesus told them a parable saying, look, the land of a rich man was very productive. There's this rich guy out there, and he had all this land, crops, all this stuff. Very, very productive. He's very rich. And this guy began reasoning to himself, saying, what should I do since I have no place to store my crops? I got so much food coming in, I, don't, I can't store it. I, I mean, I have to stack it anywhere I can. This is awesome. And then this guy says, oh, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, <laughs> soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Such a strange statement. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, when you notice when this guy is talking about all of this stuff, notice the first person pronouns in there. Uh, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And, and I will say to my soul, that's a lot of selfishness. They're like, I'm the man. Like, I, I'm doing so well that clearly I'm the man. Right? It's a lot of self-reliance. And there's no mention of God. And if there is even an allusion to God, he's in control of that too. My soul. My soul. But... And here's something I've learned as I've gotten older, and I think this is part of what the Bible calls the wisdom of the elders. As you get older, you kind of get, a, I believe, you get a greater sense of, of what's important materially. Um, and I know that's just a generic statement that's not always true, but I don't know. As I've gotten older, I value things very differently. I think it's, it's important to me for me to have a place, a house I can call my own. But I also understand that the bank really owns it still, and I gotta work on that real hard <laughs> before I retire, or it's gonna become a burden more than a help, right? And, and cars, you know, I'm the guy that used to love a different car all the time. I've had a lot of cars over my life because um, my wife has been very generous. <laughs> and uh, I, I just come to a place now where a car is a tool for me. And I happen to have a, a nice truck we bought used and I'm blessed with, but um, I, I just don't really care. The, the car itself is not as important anymore. And I understand the fragility of all of this. In other words, um, you know, when I was working in the homeless ministries, we always said to uh, the homeless people that started really just saying, well, I'm just, I know I, I'm in a really bad spot. I've done this to myself and blah, blah, blah. And we'd always be careful to say, no, that's not necessarily true. Maybe some of it's true, but honestly, we're all one paycheck away from being homeless ourselves. And that really turned the conversation, right? If, you, if you're still working and you lost your job today, with no warning, or I guess it'd be tomorrow maybe, because that'll be Monday, terrible Monday, you know, would, would you still be okay? And I think most people um, that are still working answering that would have to say no. It would be really bad. I can lose my house. I could wreck my truck. You know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. That the, the stuff that we rely on is fragile. Paul, at the end of his life, he, he had this to say to um, 
to Timothy. He had a couple of things to say to Timothy. Which one did I want to say first? There we go. Um, so Paul, at the end of his life, he knows that he's, a, he's about to die. And Timothy knows that he's about to die. And Timothy's a younger man. Um, we don't know how old he is, so I'm not even going to conjecture. But he's definitely a much younger man who Paul has been kind of mentoring. And one of the things he takes time to talk about with Timothy when he writes him this letter is he said, because Timothy is starting to lead some of the church movement, he's saying to Timothy, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty, sorry, of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of of that which is life indeed. So he's trying to tell Timothy to remind people it's okay to be wealthy. It really, really is. But don't let that be your goal. You know... um, Uh, who was it? John Wesley, he said, he's famously quoting, for once having said, uh, when it comes to finances, earn as much as you can, save as much as you can, and give as much as you can. And notice he doesn't talk about spending, although that's, that's part of it too. But he doesn't talk about that. In Revelations 3, now remember there's the church in Revelations, chapter 3 is where, uh, where God is giving this revelation to John, and he's giving it first in chapter 3 to all these churches that kind of symbolize main problems in, in Christianity. And he has this to say about Laodicea, and this church makes him sick, as we'll read. But he says in verse 14 in Revelation 3, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. So that's Jesus that, that they're talking about there. I know your deeds, that you're not cold or hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I'll I'll spit you out of my mouth. Some translation says I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom i love i reprove and discipline and therefore be zealous and repent behold i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i'll come into him and will dine with him and he with me He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So he's trying to get this whole idea across that you should prepare, but there's a difference between being responsible and being greedy, right? And it's a dangerous difference. I came up with this thought in my head this week, um, and it it just kind of came across to me. But I I started thinking, you know, greed and worry, they're lovers. So the more greed you have, the more you worry about it. Because you're worried to protect all that, whether you're all your wealth, right? And so it becomes an unhealthy kind of relationship that thrives on, e- on each other, but really doesn't produce anything good. But if you have responsibility, just honest responsibility to, to God and to his people, that includes yourself, it's a better balance. It's a better balance. And so prosperity is good, but it's hard to know when you're prepared and when you're prepared enough. I think this modern age right now is teaching us this. So let me, let me remind you of the COVID era, era that we live in, right? Let me remind you of a toilet paper shortage we recently had, right? 
But I hope some of you are paying attention, and if you're not, pay attention right now. But it's getting worse. Inflation is on the rise. Have you noticed that you're paying a whole lot more for things than you have recently? It's going to get a whole lot worse. Have you noticed that the stores are running shorter on on things? And sometimes now, for some bizarre reason, you can't find what you normally shop for. Uh, We went over to see our grandson yesterday, and Kathy said, hey, can you get me an iced tea, unsweetened iced tea in there? while we stopped by 7-Eleven because I was going to bring my son a Slurpee. Uh, (laughs) And every iced tea was out. What a weird thing to be out of, you know, iced tea. You know, I saw a headline on the AP News. I didn't read the article, but it says China has stolen Christmas in 2021. And then I just skimmed the first paragraph. And it's the idea that they're not, because of transportation issues and COVID restrictions and everything, we get a lot of our stuff from China, right? A lot of our goods. And they're not able to ship it in the same way anymore. And their, their wharves are backing up with goods. They're running out of containers to store the goods in that need to be shipped, which is going to cause, that means those things are not going to land here and we're going to be short. And that's why we're running out of iced tea. That's why we ran out of toilet paper and we will run out of more things. What happens if the bank decided there was a run on money and they froze the money you had in the bank? I remember in early 2021, one of my concerns was, or 2020, sorry, is that the bank, uh, Bank of America, not a strange little bank, it put a limit on how much money I could withdraw in one day. That concerned me. That's my money. And so I've had to decide what to do there. What if a natural disaster hit while you were at home? Are you prepared for that? What, and that could just be a power outage, right? The church, uh, we lost power on, was it Wednesday, I think? And it was gone all day. And it was kind of fun. I'm, I'm a little bit of a prepper, in case you couldn't tell. COVID has all of a sudden turned me into just a little bit of a prepper. Don't ask my wife, just a little bit. Um, uh, and uh, so I was fine. I was like, okay, did I do this right? Am I ready? And I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. I don't care about the power being out. I know, open the windows, get some air circulating in here, and uh, turn off the computer, reserve your battery, and, uh, oh, look, I have a paper Bible, and I'm preparing a sermon today. Perfect. I'm, I'm good, man. I, and I enjoyed sitting in the kind of the cooler dark and, and reading and writing. But then I had to go to the bathroom. And it's a dungeon in there. <laughs> go in there after, ch- don't do this, but go in there sometime and shut off the lights. You, you can't see this, you know. And so, you know, I, it just makes you think, are you prepared? Or what if that natural disaster hit when you were at work and you had to get home, you know? These are hard things. I'm sure they're thinking about that up in the mountains where these fires are raging right now. But what if your power at home went out for an extended period of time, two, three, four days? What if there was an emergency, in a uh, water emergency, and you couldn't get fresh water? Remember, um, it just flew out of my mind. The town that had the fracking issues and then their water, you could light it on fire. Where, where was that? Anyway, it's in the United States where they had to start uh, having bottled water and things. What if the grocery stores, and I do believe this is going to happen and is happening right now, what if they started running out of the things that you need for the way you know how to do life and eat and, and do that? I think we need to also, one of the things I've been struggling with in all of this is I just want to come up here and preach the word of God, but I also have, I'm also a shepherd and I want to make sure my flock is taken care of in all ways, not just spiritually but physically as well. And so as that, as we read through um, this wealth section, as I tell you that greed and worry are lovers, but, res- but responsi- responsibility is not, that responsibility actually defeats your worry a little bit, that's good. That's what we need to prepare for. But we also just need to prepare that even our preparations can go wrong. And so ultimately, we have to rely on the Lord. And it's scary. But I would encourage everybody who's hearing my voice 
to be just a little bit of a prepper. And all I mean by that is when you are shopping now at the grocery store, buy two of what you want that isn't going to expire soon because you might need it. And if nothing else, you'll pay less for it because in a month you're going to be paying more for it. And a month after that, and a month after that. And it's stuff you'll use anyway. It's just being responsible, and it will give you a little less worry in your life because you'll be ready. And it might require you cleaning out a closet of a bunch of junk you don't need anyway and uh, setting up a pantry. I don't know. I'm not really going to go into that. Again, I just want to come up here and preach the word of God. But I do think that things have gotten troublesome enough where we need to be prepared materially as well. And we need to take some steps. And I really encourage you to do that in a non-panicking way. You know, when I was reading this, um, one of the commentators, his name is Mark Black, as I was reading this next section, I'll read in a second here, he says something that really resonated with me, and I just wanted to quote it. He says, how will those who give their lives for others be cared for? Does not a life of following Jesus create very real problems for sustaining life itself? Because what, he, what he's saying there is, you know, John Wesley is telling us to save money. I'm telling you to be prepared and yet to give money, to be generous, not just money, but your time and talents as well, to be generous because ultimately it's God's kingdom that's the important thing here. It's not how much food is in my pantry. I can go a while without food, okay? Um, it'd probably be good for me. Uh, but it's, it's, it's loving God and relying on God, but at the same time that means he says to love his people. And so I want to make sure you're okay as well. And, I, and Kathy and I, we give generously to causes that we believe in that further the kingdom of Christ. But at some point, it starts to weigh against how much you're being prepared because when you start becoming more and more generous with your life, you're taking away more and more resources that you could just stick in savings and be prepared. So you've got to find some strange balance in there, and that's different for everybody. But remember, greed, just taking it all in, is, is a lover of worry, and that's just going to create worry. It's when you're being responsible to God and to each other and to yourself and your family that worry starts to go down a little bit because you're a little more prepared. Let me read um, the next piece of this, uh, Luke 12, verses 22 through 34. Now, he's been, Jesus has been talking to everybody, right? This rude guy interrupts him, and then he tells this parable about you know, don't get so greedy that you forget that life's pretty fragile and you might just finally be getting super wealthy and you're going to die of a heart attack today or, you know, whatever it is, right? And then he switches it, though. This is it. We have to pay attention to this. In verse 22, it starts with, and he said to his disciples. Now, disciples could just be the 12 apostles. It could be everybody in that crowd that believes him. But it has the sense of him kind of you know, pulling the focus of who he's speaking to back a little bit and focusing into just the people that are really trying to understand what he's saying. And he says to these people, his disciples, for this reason I tell you, I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, not for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food and body more than clothing. And by clothing here, he means all the stuff. He actually means, in our context, he means your house, your car, your appliances, your, your computer, your stereo, you know, all the stuff. That's clothing. And then there's the food and just the nourishment, the food and water, right? But he says, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. Now, remember the sparrows? Consider the sparrows. Now, the difference here, you may not know this, is in the Jewish world, ravens are an unclean animal, and it's out of a rule in Leviticus. And so it's a specified creature that is unclean, and that is the ravens. So he's asking you to consider this unclean bird, the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't work for what they need. They have no storeroom or barn to store it up, but God feeds even them. How much more valuable are you than birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single 
hour of his life to his lifespan. Actually, worry, I would argue, pulls hours off of your life, right? Because it leads to anxiety, which leads to heart issues, which leads to heart attacks and strokes, which leads to death. Which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the fields, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? You people, I would say there, you men of little faith. So worry is a symbol of a lack of faith. The more we worry, the less faith we have in God. And before you start feeling too convicted by that, I would actually say the more we worry, the less we're thinking about God, because God will cover that worry when you just focus on him. Do not seek what you will eat, verse 29, and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. But your Father knows you need these things. Okay, it's understandable that we want the new car. It's understandable we want a house to live in. It's understandable that we want to have the food that we want to eat. You know, it, all of this is understandable. God knows this. Your Father knows you need these things. Verse 31, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. And then maybe the sweetest verse in the whole Bible, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. So sweet. Let me read that again. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Verse 33, sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourself money belts which do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes or moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, as I, as, well, not as I, but as a person becomes more and more wealthy in life, it doesn't become more and more greedy. It becomes more and more generous, more and more thankful. And that's the spirit that we're supposed to have. And he's pointing out that everything that we have here on earth, even the things we prepare for, can be stolen from us. The thief, right? Um, and can go away, or it can rot in place even clothes that the moths get into the closets and eat holes in your clothes right i think of my prepping stuff and and um you know if if our if that if our neighborhood burned to the ground most of that prepping stuff would be gone i've got it in in plastic totes organized really well i've spent a lot of time organizing it i've spent a lot of money buying stuff to fill those totes but if a fire rages through it's all gone and I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that. What God is asking us to do, I think, is to live a rich life. There's nothing wrong with wealth. Actually, there's a lot of, of great things with wealth. But it's what you consider wealth. We need the wealth of the Spirit of course. But God is saying he knows, remember he knows, little children, that we need things of this earth too that everybody wants. Everybody in every nation wants stuff, obviously. And God is aware of that. And so he wants us basically to go ahead and fulfill those wants, fulfill those desires, build that wealth, but for a purpose. Remember that it, be, it can be gone in a moment a fire, your death, whatever it is. So don't become over-reliant on stuff. Become over-reliant on God, which is kind of impossible to do. Just become reliant on God. 
And then think about your wealth for yourself and for your neighbor and for the world. Because our wealth is for us to live well, but to help others do the same, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. That can be locally, stuff with the homeless, stuff with single moms, stuff with uh, people with mental illness, with people that are being abused, whatever is knocking people down that they're poor in spirit from our but also it can be internationally, where, you, where we're supporting missionaries around the world to advance the kingdom of God. Maybe if everybody all over the world became this kind of prepper, <laughs> the world would get better, right? Because, because what we're seeing in the world is this lack of grace due to greed. I want to have it all. I want all the power. I want all the stuff. I want all the land. But if we started saying, I actually have enough, how can I make all the power and all the land help that person over there and, and, that, and that group of people over there? And what about those people starving? What about the people in Haiti? What about sending stuff to the firefighters? What about, you know, it, it, the list is endless, just absolutely endless. Because we have to remember, Jesus was saying um, in the previous chapter, over and over and over again, pay attention because the kingdom of God has drawn near. The kingdom of God has drawn near to us, which means it's not here, although it was, he goes on to say that, but it's drawn near. And so we can pay attention to that, become part of the kingdom of God, become a citizen of, of the kingdom of God, if you will, and then we can move forward as part of the kingdom. The only, the only desire of that kingdom is to love more and more people and bring everybody into unity through Christ, our Lord and Savior. We don't have a kingdom that wants more and more power. We don't have a kingdom that wants everybody to be forced to do whatever the king says. We have a kingdom that is about loving the king and loving each other. And that's the best kingdom to live in. I have a couple of challenges for you again this week. Another, another line to memorize out of here, uh, Luke 12, 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That is one of the verses that I have, it's one of my life verses. Where is my treasure, right? Because I'm a selfish guy. And so I want a lot of stuff, but I have to remember this isn't treasure, and on some level it's kind of a waste of time. My real treasure that won't perish is my eternal life with Christ. And also I, I've got an inward thing for you to think about. Pick something, a real fear or worry that you have about life that's just pressing on you. And talk to someone about it. Think and pray about a solution. Whatever you need to do, but work on a solution. Because ignoring the worry is not a solution. <laughs> it's like ignoring Jesus is not a decision against or for him. You're just left in limbo. You're left in lukewarm. Remember, that makes Jesus a little sick. Causes him to vomit, you know. And so work on that worry and ask yourself, what what can I do? How do I build wealth that defeats this worry? And remember, that can't be greed, because that's the lover of worry. It has to be being prepared so that worry goes away. And sometimes I can't prepare because it's a worry I don't have any control of, so I have to go to God with that and watch that worry kind of dissipate or understand it's out of my hands, so why worry? It's not going to add an hour to my life, right? It might take one away. And then the other fun thing is I'm always looking for a way for us to engage other people uh, for Christ, to spread the, to grow the kingdom, right? And it's not a numbers game. That's only part, physically part of it, just like wealth. But it's about just getting other people to feel the love of Christ and to, and to find eternal life. We talk about these friends we have that die suddenly, or, or we might die suddenly, or this guy uh, from today's parable who was dying that night as he was preparing to build bigger barns tomorrow, right? Uh, he had no idea. <clears throat> so to remember the fragility of, of life and remember that that's true for other people out there. 
if you don't reach people with Christ, you may be the only opportunity they have before the end of their life. And this is real. Like, this isn't a made-up thing. When people die, there's two places to go, heaven or hell. And sometimes it's up to us where they're going to go. It's not really up to us, but we, how, you know, it's the other passages. How will they understand the gospel if they haven't heard it? And how will they hear it if someone hadn't told them, you know? And that's our responsibility to be out there. So when someone comes to you with a worry the next time, try and figure out if there's a way you can, um, if they're a, a Christian person, you can just mention this. I refer people to this passage in Matthew chapter five, chapter six, the end of Matthew chapter six, a lot that worry a lot, have anxiety issues. Um, so you could do that, or you could just use this wisdom. You know, if you're sitting out in a park, you know, and you're worried about all this stuff, you see that bird that's flying around us trying to eat our little uh, scone here at Starbucks? Um, you know, you ever think about how they, they just are really good all the time, and uh, they don't, you know, they, they, how are they even alive? How are they even eating? How are they even, like, surviving a rainstorm or a cold snap or the smoke or, you know? You find ways to talk to someone that, that brings out not your wisdom, but the wisdom that God has provided us through his scripture, because it is truth. And so when you speak truth, it speaks power to people and not just your own. All right, let me pray for us, and then I'm going to have uh, uh, people co- have someone come up for communion. Father God, I thank you for this day, um, even with the smoke in the air. Thank you for um, providing us with security. In this room, we have air scrubbers that probably makes the air in this room right now clearer than anywhere else in the county, and we're thankful for that. But we also know the reality is we're going to step out of this room in a few minutes and back into air that's not so clean. And that's a parable of life itself. So we just ask that you're constantly working in us, purifying us, especially this morning as we focus on wealth and worry, that you would continue to encourage us to build wealth in a responsible way and continue to discourage us building wealth in a a greed-focused way, that we would be known as people that are generous, helping our neighbors and our friends and our families very generously as you have been so generous with us. And teach us to to stop worrying so much about things that are out of control. Show us the times that we have spent so much time till we thought we were going to have a breakdown over some issue that just didn't come to fruition and the silliness of that. Use whatever it takes to help us, to help me stop worrying so much and just rely on you instead. All these saints, we just think of you, Jesus, the person that had no wealth, that, it, that intentionally sacrificed everything, including your life, so that we might have eternal life with you. We thank you. We adore you. We love you. We worship you. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. If there's anyone listening to my voice right now, Lord, I just ask that that you would encourage them in this knowledge of you. If they are listening and and they don't know you, Father, help them to understand that regardless of what they've encountered, the kingdom of God has drawn near to them, and it is a, a beautiful, loving kingdom. The ultimate answer and the ultimate wealth that will last into eternity, where thieves cannot steal and moths cannot ruin. In Jesus' name, amen. How's everybody doing today? Good morning. Scott talked a lot about wealth, and I don't know if, um, my name is Robert, I have three children, one, two, three, and you know, I'm wealthier than a man with three million dollars, do you know why? Because I got all I want and he still wants more. So, do you, um, Scott's been going over sermons about your integrity, and 
uh, for me, I've been a warrior for, I warrior a lot too. But then you focus on the sparrows and the, ra and the ravens, they don't worry. Scott said it all I could say, but I read this passage though when I was in Bible study. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is in the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not, not fear when the heat comes. But the leaves will be green and it will be heat. <clears throat> it will not be anxious in the year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. I thought that that passage pretty much talked about exactly what Scott's been talking about. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the security that you do give us, Lord. We just, we hope and we pray that we can see your, the benefits that you've given us, Lord, and focus on the things of this world that are beneficial to us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So now we're going to take, get your, everyone of their elements ready. Now on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took these with his, with his disciples, he took the bread and he said, take this, my body is just a sacrifice for you. And in the same way, he took the cup, said, this is my blood, the new covenant, in Jesus' name. Thanks. Thank you, Robert, for that incredible uh, communion. I'll, uh, okay, good. You got it. Sweet. So just want to go over a couple announcements and a couple last minute things before, of course, we release all of us back into the community, back into our homes, uh, and of course, the area effect that God has given to us. First things first, uh, Scott mentioned it at the beginning of the message. Um, the barbecue has been canceled due to the, some air quality obviously with the fires going on around. Um, I will be hanging around here for a little bit of time, so if anybody who may have tuned out of the live stream or didn't hear that announcement comes, I'll be here to direct them uh, appropriately. Um, and for those of you that are online and still watching with us, if you would just go ahead, it, it helps us, but mostly it helps the kingdom and it helps you. If you just drop a like, give us a share uh, from our online campus, it'll be Facebook, YouTube, anywhere. Um, it not only um, lets you know that as you're watching, uh, you're a part of this community and you're watching together, um, but also it helps spread the word and helps spread the gospel, especially on a message like today uh, about worry, which we tend to all worry about worry at some point in our lives. I think it could be really encouraging and helpful, um, so I encourage you to do that as well. We have some prayer requests um, and just some things in general to be praying for, uh, first and foremost. Uh, for everything going on in Afghanistan, for the families of the 13 Marines uh, at the time that had been killed. Of course, we want to be praying for them, and we'll be covering this all as well uh, at the end as we pray together. For Haiti and the earthquake and all the devastation that's happening there, um, our hearts go out to them. Um, also, for rain um, in the appropriate way, for all the firefighters that are battling so hard right now uh, with everything raging on around California, which, which honestly at this point, I just kind of feels normal almost, and I don't like that, but we praying for them, for their safety, for their integrity, uh, for their strength and their endurance as well. Um, we're also still praying for funding. Uh, for the small travel trailer for the homeless ministries that we've talked about a lot up here. Um, if you want more information about that, please talk to Scott. Um, he'll be able to direct you to the right channel in the right way. And of course, last but not least, one of the ones that's physically the closest here, but I haven't gotten to meet them yet. I don't know if I will until who knows when, but of course, the Granberry Owen um, and just praying for Becca and uh, David, and uh, as their journey starts as new parents, as many people in this room and, of course, online um, can probably remember their firstborn and all the challenges and uh, fun times that you were 100% prepared for because 
Everyone knows when you read a bunch of books, you always have the right answers for the situation for that book. Uh, there's nothing you have to learn on the fly, right? So just praying for them. Uh, and that is a whopping eight pounds and five ounces. So it's a little bodybuilder in the making, uh, of course. So with that being said, if you want to dive in, uh, lastly, uh, and just kind of pick apart and talk about worry and talk about this message in a great community. Chris, we got Sermon 2.0. That's led by Elderberry, and I'm so glad I get to drop that today. Uh, it feels like it's been a while. Uh, that's Wednesday night. Uh, go ahead and hit him up. Hit up Scott. Hit up John. Hit up any one of us, uh, the deacons or, of course, the elders, and we can hopefully direct you uh, to that link. It's also available on the website, so check that out. And uh, I'd just like to pray for us really fast before I release all of us again. And, um, well, one more thing. Because we talked a lot about worry today, um, but when it comes to memorizing Scripture, one of the things that stuck out to me, and I actually had this verse highlighted before today, just one of my own previous devotional times, was verse 34 of Luke 12. To reiterate, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. And I read a weird version, so it's worded slightly differently, but there it is. And for those of us that maybe aren't really sure, you know, if we are worrying about something or whatever, I have a challenge and a great way to figure out, more than likely, where we store up our treasures. And I do this probably about once a month to check the condition of my heart, and I encourage everybody here or online to do the same. I think that the best way to determine and flesh out where your treasure is stored is to look at two things as I have been taught. The spirit of it is you look at your checkbook and you look at your calendar. Where you choose to spend your time and your resources, it's probably a good indicator of where your heart is stored up. Father God, we thank you for this day. God, I thank you for this incredible community of people. Whether it be here in person, whether it be online. God, we've all gone through trials and errors, we have things that we worry about that are of great concern. But God, we just want to turn those things over to you. Father, not just for the sake of trying to relinquish and to just throw and, and cast aside and not be responsible, but God, because we know that we alone do not have the strength or the power to truly take care of those things. And so we ask for your intercession on those things. Of course, God, from everything from baby Owen to Afghanistan and Haiti, we just ask that your sovereign hand, we know it is over it, but God, we just ask that you would help uncover to us how we may be a blessing for these people, whether it be through prayer of comfort, which we pray over them, or God, whether it be through conversation that we can just support, we just ask that you would open the doors and reveal to our hearts and our eyes what we can do and what you call us to do in order to love you and love one another. Father, we thank you for this day. In your name we pray. Amen. You're all released. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you next week.